Hiya and welcome to Build. I'm Daniel Welsh and we are live from London as always. Today we are joined by the amazing star of RuPaul's Drag Race and the reigning champion of Celebrity Big Brother. It's Courtney Aft. Hi. Hi. If you are a Courtney fan and you've got a question for her, then you are in luck because we are live. We are on Twitter. You can tweet us at Build Series LDM with any questions you've got for Courtney. Or... Phones off, please. <laughs> God, what's going on? Oh, it's my phone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> or um, if you're watching live on Facebook, then drop a comment in the video you're currently watching and we'll do our best to get that to Courtney before the end of the interview. Courtney Act, hello. Welcome to Build. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. We've got a lot to get through. Thank you. So I'm just going to crack on. All right. It's been a good few months since you left. Possibly the... two. What, it was February, March, April. Two and a bit. Two and a bit yeah. months since you left the Celebrity Big Brother yes. house. How has life been for you since then? I'm guessing pretty hectic. Well, the weird part is, is that life since RuPaul's Drag Race has been pretty hectic, yeah. to be fair. Um, and... I, like, my my schedule's kind of like, I can tell you what I'm doing this time next year. Like, when could you ever say that in life? I don't know. I never See, could. that just makes me want to have, like, an anxiety attack. Like, well, being that far planned ahead. Both. Like, it kind of makes it, like, if someone's like, what are you doing next weekend? I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm busy. But, um... So, like, I already had all this stuff scheduled. Like, I had this tour of Australia of my show, Under the Covers, coming to the UK very, very soon. Um... <laughs> And seamless. Seamless. Yeah. Um, and, um, uh, and oh, no, my coffee's wearing off. <laughs> Under the covers. You've been ever so busy. I have been busy. Yeah, yes, thank you. And, Evidently. And so I was in Australia doing a tour of my show, which was already sort of planned. And I was like, but I just want Big Brother. I need to be in the UK. And I was doing a tour, but now I'm back here. And then I'm back in Australia on Friday. So things have gotten busy. And I think the biggest change is that Usually I would be flying between like Sydney in LA and LA, which is like a quaint 14 hour flight. <laughs> but now I'm flying back and forth between Sydney and London, which is like a 30 hour flight from oh door God. to door. It's well, I mean, you, you don't look like you've come straight from a flight. I'm not usually one for commenting on a lady's appearance, but it must be said, Go for it. stunning today. Thank you. Uh, how are you finding all of that then, the 30 hour flights between London and Sydney and then back to LA and bouncing all over the place? It's horrible, but <laughs> I'm, having fun once I get here and like I know that I, I, talking about the weather is so trite I realise but the weather has been so good here for the last week I mean today and yesterday is a little bit shit mm -hmm. but like still pretty good um, and so it's quite lovely when you land and the weather's beautiful and you're just strolling through the streets of London and the sun is shining down on the urine soaked yeah. gutters from the night before and it's quite pungent but it's beautiful to look mm -hmm. at so yeah because it's a lovely idyllic view of london we've yeah got there. just be hope hopeful that's why hay fever is really good because you can't smell when the sun is heating up the urine in the streets well there we go you heard it here first people courtney act on why hay fever is actually yeah. good Maybe that's just an East London thing that it smells like urine a lot. I Why mean, am I fixated with urine? I'm sorry. I mean, this is turning into a very different sort of interview Isn't very quickly. Um, okay, well, let's talk about, uh, you just touched on RuPaul's Drag Race. Yes. Um, and how that's kind of given you a sort of cult sort of fame. Yes. But since then, Celebrity Big Brother, at least in the UK, has surely pumped things up a bit here in in Britain. Yes. Well, how have you found that? Well, before I was just recognized by um, gays and girls at makeup counters. Yeah. But now, like, taxi drivers are like, G'day, Shane J. How you going? <laughs> oh, my wife love you on Celebrity Big Brother. Let me get her on the phone. And like... Are you actually driving cabs on the site? No, that was I'm, scarily convincing. You. Right. Um, and I just, like, it's fascinating. And I keep surveying taxi drivers. I'm like, oh, so tell me about, like, what you... And he's like, oh, I just love you and Andrew. The two of you together. It just warmed me art. And I was like, wow, the UK is such a different place. Like, when you've got, like, straight taxi drivers who are talking about their love of your bromance on Celebrity Big Brother... Yeah. Like that, you, I mean, you all live here, so it's probably not that exciting for you. But for me, coming from Australia or America, it's mind-blowing. Uh, you just touched on your bromance there, which was one of the key <laughs> points in CBB, as well as um, you bringing issues like gender and sexuality and other sort of LGBTQ subjects to people who wouldn't necessarily have considered them before. Yes. And in that way, you're kind of now being looked to with questions about things like that. I was just going to, I just saw you sink in your chair there. No. Does that bring its own sort of pressure? Is no, what I, want I to love ask. it. Um, I, I just love, you know, it's weird. Cause like in my life and my world, I talk about and 
live gender and sexuality and it's all quite normal yeah. to me. But the thing that you realise when you're on like Celebrity Big Brother and you're talking to people outside of your own echo chamber um, that not that most people don't understand. I mean, even gay men in the gay community don't understand the nuances of gender and yes, sexuality certainly. and all of these terms and things. And that's okay. Um, and so it's great when you have an opportunity to talk about it on like Channel 5. Like, like there's shows that are like much more highbrow trying to discuss the nuances of gender, but like... Channel 5 is like reaching the masses yeah. and it's people are sitting at home or on YouTube watching these clips and talking to their families and being like, oh, okay, so there's more than just two things. There's more than just gay and straight or more than just man and woman or more than just black and white. So I think that's cool. See, like a lot of my straight friends, when I said that I was coming to interview you today, who saw you on Celebrity Big Brother, they were like, oh, she was so articulate in the house and so eloquent when she was talking about gender and sexuality. Um, and also so patient, but let's be honest, had the cameras not been there, would you have been quite so patient all of the time? Because there were times when I was watching at home and I was like, oh my God, this again. Would I have called Anne Whittaker a Catholic? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> That's exactly what I want to know, yes. Well, she is a Catholic. She certainly um, is. <laughs> That's not meant to be a euphemism. It kind of came out like I was... Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, I... Um, I just think when you're talking to someone, like, okay, I was in the bathroom talking to all of the guys about gender and was sort of trying to explain the difference between the drag identity and the trans identity, all possibly while tucking. Um, <laughs> Which is a great place to be when you're exactly. talking about such topics. And um, I mean, better in the bathroom than like on the tube, because yeah. that's a bit awkward. Um, and. Um, and yeah, it was just cool to have a group of people who were like essentially like alpha males in a way listening to a conversation about gender and more than just listening, interested and asking questions. And I think because they knew that they I wasn't going to bite their hand uh -huh. and that they could ask questions as long as they're being respectful, they don't have to know all of the answers. I think the pr one of the issues with conversations today is that often like people stand on opposite sides of the room and yell things at each other. Yeah. Like that's a metaphor, but also they probably do do that. Like in <laughs> parliament, that's exactly what they do. Yes. They're just like, and they scrape, like it would just be better if they came and sat close to each other, lowered their voices and just like had a chat. One at a time. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I, I guess I tried to do. Um, on, on Celebrity Big Brother. And then, you know, with Anne, it would be... I don't agree with most of everything Anne <laughs> stands for. Like, realistically, if you look at her voting record mm -hmm. in Parliament, not just, like, somebody with different opinions, like an actual legislator that has voted against my rights and probably every person's rights in this room. Yeah. Um, and that can be challenging because... Like, we're talking about actual... It's not, it's not just some older lady who's sticking to her opinions. Um, but at the same time, if I want Anne to respect me and what I'm saying, then I have to respect her and what she's saying. Um, but I think the, the area where it becomes problematic is if you think about, like, a scientist versus a religious person, a scientist constantly goes about... Uh, the things that they believe, trying to disprove them. They're looking for other evidence that will show them why what they believe is wrong mm -hmm. so that they can have a more evolved understanding of the truth. Whereas with religion, it's kind of the opposite. It's like, I don't want to know anything that might be contrary to what my very specific yes. beliefs are. And so I think that's sort of like maybe where I struggled with Anne is that she wasn't interested in anything else, any other bits of information. As she wasn't interested in seeing something through someone else's lens, only her own. Something that kind of bothered me a little bit, and this yeah. is something you were in the house at the time, so you wouldn't have really appreciated it. Were you bothered? I, I, was, I was bothered. I was. I was kind of, I was on social media watching the show, and a lot of sort of gay people that I follow were kind of rooting for Anne and sort of finding her this sort of very silly camp figure making gifts and all that sort of thing. And for me, I was like, well, hang on. 
if you look at her voting record, as you've just said, there's yeah. this, this, and this. Is that something that you've encountered and been maybe frustrated by, or were you just oblivious in the house at the time? Um, well, you know what? In my conversations with taxi drivers, they'll often say, like, oh, I love that Anne Whittacombe. And I'll be like, oh, okay, tell me why you love Anne Whittacombe. And like, oh, she's just an older lady who really sticks to her guns. Now they're Scottish. I was the going to say, what the, um, <laughs> where, where's this taxi taking you? But okay. <laughs> um, they have Scottish taxi drivers in London, too, you know. All right, Sometimes forgive, people forgive emigrate. Um, and, um, and they would say to me, oh, I just love that she was an older lady who stuck to her guns. And I was like, oh, okay. Like, so the reason you like her isn't necessarily because you're completely aware of what she stands for. Because she is, she's a lovely older lady. She's kind of like your bigoted grandma at Christmas dinner that you like know thinks you're going to burn in hell, but also you just, you know, have a it's good Christmas. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. One yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, at the same time, she was probably one of the people that I enjoyed talking to most in the house. Because when am I ever going to get the chance to live in a house with a 70-year-old conservative politician who voted against every piece of pro-LGBT legislation <laughs> that ever came before them in 20 year, three years of parliament? I mean, you would hope just once. Just once, I hope. Yeah. And I'm glad that I did because it was just fascinating to like see that, you know, she's not trying to be... Like, a, a lot of people would hear that and, like, try and burn her at the stake, just as she would probably try and burn me at the yeah. stake as well. But uh, that's a whole different reality show altogether. Um, <laughs> Coming soon to Channel 5. The Salem Witch Trials <laughs> with Courtney Act and Anne Whittacombe. Um, and the kicker is that if you don't burn, it means you're a witch. But if you do burn, then they've made a mistake and, like, sorry, but you're dead. Sorry, now I'm going off tangent. Um, <laughs> anyway, what was the point? And, yeah, it was... What was the question? I, something about not living with Anne ever again, anyway. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah, I can't imagine that she'll invite me to the moors for high tea anytime soon. You never know. You never know. Uh, can we talk about RuPaul's Drag Race, please? Sure. Um, because obviously that was where a lot of people, I'm guessing, in this room will have first encountered you. Um, it's been a few years since you were on the show. You made it through to the final, which is obviously amazing. How do you look back at that experience now? How do you feel when you look back at your time on Drag Race? Um, it's so different to Big Brother. A, Big Brother, you're in the house 24 hours a day for a month. You're on camera 24 hours a day. You only see one in a bit hours a day. But, like, Drag Race is, like, six weeks, five weeks, however many weeks, like, two episodes a day. You get one hour out of, like, what's 48 plus, 72 hours of content. We're, we're, we're with you, we're following. Yeah, yeah, get your calculators out, kids. <laughs> um, and so it's a much, there's 14 characters in squeezed into like 42 minutes of content and it's a very different style of show. Like Drag Race is amazing at creating catchphrases and um, and, and like two-dimensional sort of like, like, reality TV characters. That's what yeah. reality TV traditionally is. It's a competition at the end of the yeah. day, yeah. And the cool thing about Big Brother is that you get this like three dimensional experience, I think, and like understanding of a person because you see them when they're waking up and you see them when they're drunk and you see them when they're hungry or yeah. hangry or um, all of those facets. So it's just, it's really different. Um, but Drag Race has this whole creative aspect, which is amazing when you get to like, do a, a, a musical challenge or an interview challenge, both of which I won. Um, <laughs> I always remember those two, probably because I won. I'm like, what else did we do on that show? Oh, I don't know. But yeah, I, I loved both of them, but for different reasons. Um, a lot of the fans off the back of season six will have followed you on Twitter and Instagram and all the other whatever sites and seen you talking about gender and all of these things that are important to you but a lot of them will also have not have. So if there's been a gap between you being on Drag Race and CBB, it's like, oh, wow, suddenly Courtney has all of these fabulous opinions that she's sharing. Do you wish that you'd had the opportunity to kind of speak a bit more about that when you were on Drag Race? Um, I do. I'm. You know what? I'm so glad that Celebrity Big Brother came along because yeah. I feel like it was like the balm on the... Oh. I was going to say the wound, but that sounds like I'm calling <laughs> Drag Race a wound, which I'm not. It was like one of the most amazing experiences. Of course, yeah. But I did come out of it feeling a little like damaged because I felt um, I felt like a, a what was maybe 10% of my character became 60% of my character and the really important part, which is the conversations yeah. about just stuff, uh, 
doesn't have room on on Drag Race. Um, there's not like a space really for that. I mean, we saw on this season uh, the conversation about race between Vixen and Aquaria with some like amazing narration uh, by Monet. But um, <laughs> did I was it because I said a name funny or because I said no, it wasn't. No, no, she was. She gave amazing narration. She was like, the optics of this situation are. I mean, and she I is basically the narrator of this season. I as know. Well, which she, I love. I, can we, sorry, we're talking about Drag Race, but specifically, Asia, Monet, Monique, and the Vixen. From that first episode in Untucked, when the four of them are on the couch together, I just fell in love. I know people may seem to see the Vixen as problematic or or ready to fight, which she said from the get-go, but I just love the four of them so no, much. No, I'm a big fan of the Vixen. Like, I like that she is willing to stick up for herself. I don't think she necessarily starts arguments. She just finishes. She them. does finish them. <laughs> She'll wipe the floor with yeah, you. Yeah, she will. Yeah. She's got no time for... Kind of the opposite of you on CBB, actually. It's just very like, no, this is how it is. Let's move on. But I think I kind of admire that about her. Like, when she called out Aquaria um, in that situation for not speaking her mind about Miss yeah. Cracker... Um, I was like, yeah, go on. Like, <laughs> like when you're sitting there, it's just so easy to like bitch behind somebody's back. But then when she called her out and brought it to, to light, I was like, no, I, I like that. I'm, I'm here for it. Well, I mean, you were there. You know you've only got a limited amount of hours in the day to talk anyway. So you've just yeah. got to crack on, haven't get you? Get it out. Speaking of, yes. we are on the clock right now. Okay. So I'm just going to get this interview back on track. Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, let me ask you about, speaking of Drag Race, one of the big... Um, headlines around the show in the last, say, six months has been, I'm sure you know that what i That interview in The Guardian? Yeah, the interview in The Guardian. And obviously that came out right at the time when you were winning all of this praise for being so eloquent ah. on the same subject. And I was just wondering if you had any opinions on that. The interview in The Guardian being RuPaul's comments about transgender people, specifically trans contestants on the show, to bring everyone up to speed. Yeah. Courtney, let's hear it. Um, Ru, Ru had sort of said that uh, she didn't feel that there was a place for uh, trans drag performers or, a lot of people have forgotten, um, cis uh, women, women yes. as hyper queens, which is like a when, for those of you playing at home, uh, <laughs> when uh, women... Well, the term is cis women. So cis is the opposite of trans. So if you're trans, it means you you, you got that bit, like mm -hmm. trans. So cis is just basically people who are not trans. So unless you're part of the 3% of people who are trans watching, then you're probably cis, just so you know. Fill you in. Um, so uh, Catch yeah, everyone cis else. women doing drag, which is called uh, hyper queens. There's many different names. I believe hyper queen is the preferred term. So Rue said that, uh, that there wasn't a place for hyper queens or trans women on drag race because drag is a middle finger to a male dominated society. Yes. And then as a male commented that he had set himself up as the gatekeeper to decide at which point in Peppermint's transition it was appropriate for her to no longer participate in drag race. Yes. So because Peppermint, although identified as trans and was living as a woman that she didn't have a breast augmentation and therefore she could be on Drag Race. But if she had had breasts, then she couldn't have been. Just seemed like a really weird argument to yeah. make. And I actually kind of understand Rue's opinions because I remember like probably not more than four, actually through my friendship with Chaz Bono, who I met on Drag Race in the musical challenge, which I won. Yes. Um, sorry, <laughs> yes, the interview forget. challenge, not the musical challenge. Um, I had my eyes open and through this global conversation of gender that has happened in a dare I say post Caitlyn Jenner world like lover or hater she really started a conversation absolutely yeah and I came to understand the nuances of the trans identity and also um, think a lot more about my own uh, male privilege and also about like the misogyny that exists in our world and um, and so yeah it was just it was it's a it's an interesting irony, perhaps, when a man is commenting on a middle finger to the male-dominated world, but is actually uh, using their own maleness to, A, make judgments about women's bodies, and it was, it was it just got a bit messy. Yeah. Um, Rue did apologise in the end, and I was wondering, do you have an opinion on the apology? Um, you know what? I, I, it's the first time I've heard Rue... He's, he's very... Um, he stands by his guns. Yes. 
Uh, and I haven't ever heard him backtrack or apologize for anything. In fact, I remember a comment of his uh, when somebody suggested that he be reprimanded for some previous, um, I'll say anti-trans comments, mm -hmm. that he said, ain't nobody gonna be telling me what to do, I pay the light bill around here. So he kind of like dug his heels in. Yeah. And he did dig his heels in before his apology where mm -hmm. he commented that um, he, you can, what was it about the Special he the Olympics? Can, he you can, can take. He conflated the trans identity to people doping in the Olympics. Yes. Like, it, I don't know. It just, like, it just seemed like a peculiar uh, standpoint. But it, he does, I do understand in some ways the points he's making because I have in the past thought that way. But when I knew better, I did better. It's interesting because you were just talking about the housemates on CBB and mm. how they were asking questions and how they didn't know and how it's kind of all right as long as you don't say anything insensitive. Mm. And it's kind of the opposite in this yeah. respect, I would say. Well, actually, Dapper uh, brought up some really great points because he came under a lot of fire for some... Oh, I forgot he was on that show. Sorry, for please some... do continue. <laughs> Sorry if you're watching Dapper. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, he made some comments uh, that sort of brought down his career, some some rape jokes yep. and some very misogynistic uh, comedy. And he said that he'd come under a lot of fire. He'd done a lot of interviews with um, with feminists, uh, jur feminist journalists who had just done a lot of this and he just did a lot of that yep. back at them because they didn't help him understand what the problem was. And he said that him and I sitting there like late night in the, the passive smoking area, um, <laughs> and talking, that's what, that was what it was for me. I tell you what, I must have like just hacking up tar after just that in the house with the boys. It was like, <sighs> ooh. Uh, but I digress. I would have been concerned for the wigs, but that's just me personally. Oh, I know. The wigs smell. It's horrible. It reminded me of the 90s. <laughs> um, but um, when you could smoke in gay bars or in just bars or just <laughs> anywhere. Um, so Dapper and I had these conversations about like why those comments may not have been appropriate and I explained these concepts of male privilege and and explained why there was uh, misogyny in his comments and stuff like that and I remember him being like oh so I feel like I just learnt more f in 15 minutes of actually talking about the subject than all of these interviews of these people just telling me that I was wrong mm -hmm. um, so I just that was actually a pivotal point for me where I was like oh I think there's something in this whole conversational technique <laughs> and decided to stick with it. Um, on the subject of conversations. Clutching this oh microphone God, It's like white like knuckle, it's, isn't it? It's terrible. Like, um, hands. Sorry. Um, this one's stronger, it's my wanking hand, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> sorry. Stunning, <laughs> stunning stuff. Um, moving swiftly on, you, uh, I mentioned earlier, a lot of people are now looking to you to answer questions about kind of gender and LGBT issues and all that sort of thing. Um, what do you think is the next frontier that we as LGBT people need to need to kind of overcome next? Yeah, I mean, if you look at our Western civilizations, things are pretty decent for the most part uh, for uh, queer people. And um, interestingly, the Commonwealth Games were just on in Australia, uh, and I think it's 37 countries in the Commonwealth. It's still in some way either illegal or criminal to uh, to be to be gay um, and in two of those countries it's punishable by death these are countries in the commonwealth the british commonwealth that we're all members of and there's a charter of values in the commonwealth that talks about equality and um and theresa may has just recently actually stood up at chogham the commonwealth heads of G mm. whatever it is <laughs> Dot, dot, dot. Sorry, we'll fill that in later. Yeah, the meeting where all of the heads of the Commonwealth go and talk about being members of the Commonwealth. And she brought up the fact that um, it's, it's not in line with the Commonwealth's charter of uh, values that uh, it should be, that it's illegal. It's not just, when I was talking about same-sex marriage, we're talking about illegal to be gay in so many of these countries. Um, and out of the 60... Five, no, 65,000, 6,500. Oh, that's a really big difference. Out of the lots of people who were competing <laughs> in the Commonwealth handled. Games, there was like 11 people who were out. Mm -hmm. And I did the math. No, it was 65,000. No. What's 10% of 6,500? Is that 65? 
Yeah. Six, 10% of 6,500 is 650. Okay, so there was 6,500 people competing. And so, like, if you take 10%, which is a generous estimate, but, like, even let's say half of that, that's, like, 325 people that should have been queer competing yeah. in the games. And there was 11. Um, so I think that turning our attention towards uh, people in other countries that don't have not just queer rights but human rights as yeah. progressive as ours here in the UK or in the US or in Australia, I think that's probably a really good uh, place to start looking. I agree, definitely. And I think as well, you know, you just mentioned things for us in whatever country, the UK, Australia, America, they seem pretty okay but actually, if you look, there's a lot of people who are still kind of wanting to overturn stuff. Yeah. And for me, it feels like for the first time in my life, it looks like things could be starting to go backwards a bit. And I was just wondering what would be your advice to anybody who was feeling a bit uneasy or kind of afraid in the current climate? I think if you look at history, it always moves forward and it always becomes more progressive. Like if you look at now to 100 years ago, it has gotten considerably more progressive like that is just the direction that we're yeah. moving so a take solace in that b know that in every major uh you know in the u.s if you look at the the black civil rights movement every time there was like a big step forward there was a huge correction to that because it makes people feel uncomfortable when you know for the most part like especially in the u.s when like middle class white men feel like they're having their power taken away yeah. when other people get equality. And it's not, equality is not pie. You know, there's not like, if I have a slice, it means you don't get a slice. Like the more equality for everyone, the more equality for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I think that, yeah, equality and is always progressing in the direction, it's always expanding. And I think, um, I think, like, you just got to keep fighting. The cool, the strange little silver lining to, like, Donald Trump uh, is that people are have been shaken awake yeah. and are now realising that they have something to fight for. Uh, let's get back to you very quickly before sure. we wrap up. Um, Courtney, actually, by the way, is bringing her under the covers to her to the UK later this year, so make sure you're there for that. Sorry, I feel like I've barely mentioned it, so That's I need to put right. it really quickly. I'm starting, I'm starting at the Brighton Fringe in May, and then there's, like, London, Glasgow, Cardiff, sold out, so we added another one. Thank you, Wales. Nice. Um, Who Birmingham. knew you were so big in Wales? Pardon? Who knew you were so big in Wales? Well, actually, one of my most memorable gigs, it was a Battle of the Seasons show. Should I? Do you have important things? Am I just rabbiting on? Is just this all right? Give us, give us the headline. The bullet points. Yeah. Basically, at the tram shed in Wales, they would not let us leave the stage. And so Adore, Jinx and I just like, we were like, okay, well, we'll do an encore, but we don't actually have one. <laughs> um, so Jinx was just like, Aah! and I think Cartier uh, like did the worm in the background. And yeah, but so I'm looking forward to going back to Wales. Amazing. Yeah. Have you got any other amazing stories from the road that you can regale us with ahead of the tour? Uh, I mean, probably family friendly. Yeah, one. family friendly. Uh, uh, but please tell me the non-family friendly ones. Once okay, later. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's going to be a really fun tour. There's like, and I'm finishing in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Oh, that's amazing. Which is just, if you guys have not been to Edinburgh, it's like it's a train ride away, right? Yeah. yeah like it's a few hours. It is so amazing. There is so much amazing theatre and cabaret and I just love it. It's a great way to finish the tour, to go and see everybody and get inspired for next year's show. So obviously you've done music, you've done yes. TV, yes. you've done um, the stage shows coming yes. up. Is there anything that you'd Porn. particularly like no, to do? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Courtney Act, Andrew Brady's, no. Um, you heard it here <laughs> first, people. <laughs> Build exclusive. Is there anything else I want to do? Yeah, I want to like, I feel like I've always wanted to do like bring the Sunny and Cher show variety glamour into a 2018 context. So, like, that's, okay. that's what I want next. Well, I did read somewhere that there was the possibility for some class of talk show. Yeah, is well... There, can you tell us, is there any truth to this? There's nothing... I've got a party line that I've, like, memorised. Beautiful. Well, actually, I haven't memorised it, but I'll try and, like... <laughs> I, I usually look it up on my phone and read it, but my phone's out there that was making the noise before. Um... Uh, yeah, basically we're like working on a thing and it has nothing's been commissioned and something, something, but oh, like yeah. something, fingers something, crossed. Something, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds amazing. So what kind of thing would that be with this variety that you just described? Well, yeah, we're working, we're workshopping ideas at the moment. So um, 
just, you know, who what see what happens, I guess. But, yeah, that's, like, ultimately I would absolutely adore, like, a, a variety style show. A bit of glamour, a bit of singing, like Bob Mackie gowns. But, yeah. like, the, like, my version, like, Marco Marco gowns <laughs> um, and... And variety and glamour and guests and stuff. Is there anyone you'd particularly like to have on as a guest? Oh. Um, any suggestions? Who would be a good guest? I feel like you probably owe it to Chaz after you won the... Um, yeah, Chaz would be a great guest. You just make sure you don't call him Chad. No. Obviously he's not a big fan of, um, from what I can gather. <laughs> so, just sidebar on that. I'm, I'm dating a London gentleman at the moment. And the other day, I said something about taking some clips from that interview challenge and putting them on this reel that we're making for this thing that may or may not be happening. And, um, something, something. And he was like, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. Didn't you keep calling him Chad? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know I'm Courtney, right? Not Trinity. Well, I can see how you can confuse us. As, as we know, you won that challenge as I well. I won that challenge. You mentioned so seldomly. Did Trinity win that challenge? No, Courtney won that challenge. Not to my recollection. We've had a question in from um, Social, actually. Julie says she loves your Scottish accent. Thank you. I'm so sorry, Julie, wherever you are. <laughs> um, she wants to know, which is your favourite country to tour in and do you find any differences with the audience participation in different countries? I didn't listen to the question just because I was thinking, <laughs> you know when, like, you know how you're, like, you're not meant to, like, do, like, I was at a Chinese restaurant the other day and the person said, insert bad Chinese accent, it, doing, like, a Scottish accent or a Geordie accent is not, like, that's not, like, culturally offensive is I mean it? we'll have to wait and see on social media yeah, we'll won't we <laughs> it's I... like Christmas morning um, wait what was the question again um, have you got particular favourite places to tour in and do you find audience participation different in different ones yes it's so different the UK is my favourite place to perform and I'm not just saying that because the US is lovely Australia is lovely but like maybe it's like pantomime in the UK like you're all very audible very interactive and the further north you go in the UK the better it gets well I can I can vouch for that yeah. obviously when the people get like the, the further north you go the more loose people get but you want to do the show early you want to do like a 7 p.m show you don't want to wait till 8 30 because people are already vomiting in their wigs by then so and I can attest to that as well yay not that I've ever vomited in a wig before. No, and not your own anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what about levels of audience participation? Are people more up for it? Yes. Up north as well. The further north. Up for go audience participation, that is. I'm not disparaging <laughs> the good name of Newcastle from whence I come. <laughs> um, I mean, people in the UK in general are up for audience participation more than any other country in the world, group of countries in the world, uh, more than any other kingdom in the world. And. Um, and Ireland as well. Hi, Ireland. Um, I know you're always, especially by like not. UK people, it's all people are like, anyway, I digress. But Ireland gets pissed off um, when they're forgotten, but they're not forgotten. Um, I, the audiences in the UK and Ireland are very, very up for audience participation in answer to your question. <laughs> And um, while we're on the subject of social questions, they've put this one in big and red, so I know that they mean business. What can we expect from the tour? You can expect... That's probably because my publicist is out the back saying, <laughs> make sure they ask us something about the tour. Um, it's called Under the Covers, and it's like a 75-minute cabaret, and it's me and a pianist and someone to play... No, the piano, for the pianist to play, because um, right. I can't play the piano. And um, it's just like costumes and songs and comedy and glamour and uh, a lot of famous covers of covers. So, you know Bjork's song, It's Oh So Quiet? I'm familiar. It's a cover of a song from 1951 by Betty Hutton, which is a cover of a song from 1948 called Und jetzt ist so still, which is German for It's Oh So Quiet. <laughs> so, like, there's music history as well. I mean, you really, you're going to learn something at this Did you show. know Ray of Light was a cover by I Madonna? I did. Oh, you did? I mean, there's, yeah, I'm a special case, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cover. It's like this, like, folk song by Curtis Muldoon from 1971. It's like... Ding, da, ding, da. Zephyr in the sky, yeah, nada. I feel like Janice from the Muppets. <laughs> oh my god, that is such the vibe I'm getting, actually. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. So, um, songs, costumes, wig changes, you get it all. No nail changes, that's more of a Beyonce thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's the next frontier yeah. to overcome. Who can change his nail color during a Coachella performance? Beyonce, do you, do you know what I'm talking about, right? Beyonce changed her nail color. I mean, to be fair, it was probably just a coat of paint. Like, you could still tell the base was black, but yeah. the, the base of the nail was black. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounded like I delved into race territory, but I didn't. <laughs> We're doing so well, Courtney. Oh. <laughs> no, that's it. That's my answer. Yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, that is actually all we've got time Aww. for. I'm really sorry. I could literally talk to you all day. Um, but as previously discussed, please go and see Courtney on tour because it sounds like it's going to be amazing, right? CourtneyAct.com forward slash under. That website again, CourtneyAct.com <laughs> forward slash under. So it kicks off at the end of May and it's coming to the UK and Ireland all summer, right? Yeah, May in Brighton, uh, June throughout every all of the, the middle and then... Uh, August in Edinburgh. Amazing. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Please give it up one more time for the amazing <laughs> Courtney Art. Thank you. Thank you.